And he said, um, I'll never forget his words. He said, mum, throughout our many lives, our souls need to experience all there is to experience. And it's only when our souls are strong enough that they can take on their biggest challenge. This is my biggest challenge. I'm not coming back. And it's like, I'm dealing with your tumour. I'm dealing with your frozen shoulder. I'm dealing with this. And nobody talks to each other. And when you say, is everything connected, anything connected, they look at you like you're just bloody mad. He said, you've got 60 people out there who this could help. I said, my son's, you know, this is not just him that this helps. And he literally put his fingers in his ears and he said, and he looked away and he said, I tow the party line. I don't want to hear it. I tow the party line. Welcome to The Wellness Way with me, Philly J. Lay, a lay person's guide to your natural health systems, your very own NHS. Hello, lovely people, and welcome to another episode of The Wellness Way with Philly J. Lay. Please, please subscribe to this podcast, turn on your notifications and tell everybody you know so we can get the algorithms working in our favour because we have such important information to get out here. And today I'm going to introduce to you a woman I absolutely adore. I first saw her on uh, daytime TV, actually, this morning, five years ago, and I just listened to her story and I could not imagine what this woman had gone through. The amazing Callie Blackwell, she works holistically with plant medicines, nature, energy and breath. Callie, welcome to The Wellness Way. So lovely to have you here. Oh, thank you so much, Billy. I am so excited to be here as you are just such an inspiration to me. And so to be on this podcast is actually such an honour. So I'm very, very oh. grateful to, to that you invited me on here. So thank you so very much. Oh, I'm blushing now. I'm, I'm not <laughs> inspirational. I'm just a mad woman on a mission. <laughs> me too. Me too. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. I'd like you to start by telling our audience your story and the story of your son, Darren. And you are the author of A Boy in Seven Billion. There's the book. Fantastic. <laughs> and this is one of the most heart-wrenching stories I had ever heard. And I don't know as a mother how you get through that, but I know how you got through it. And I want to unfold this from the beginning. So tell us how this started for you. Wow. Um... So yeah, it was in 2010 that my eldest son then, who was 10 years old, Darren, he was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And of course that turned my world upside down. And very, very quickly I learned that my child wasn't mine um, when they told me that he would be made a ward of the court and taken into care if I didn't allow chemotherapy. Um, and at that time I had, I didn't have the confidence or the knowledge or the wherewithal or anything to, to go and do anything else with him. So of course I, I followed the uh, the guidelines and I went down the path and um, and then two years later, whilst on active chemotherapy, he was diagnosed with a second cancer called Langerhans cell sarcoma. Now, there was only 50 cases of, of that since records began, and there were only five people in the entire world that had Langerhans cell sarcoma at that time. And he was the only one to have it as a secondary cancer. And he was the youngest. So he was the only person in the entire world <laughs> that they didn't know what to do with him. And of course we want our children to be unique, you know, <laughs> but this, not that unique. Uh, no, no, not unique, not yes. that, <laughs> You know, when you've got a team of doctors saying, we have never seen this before, we don't know what to do. So they sent off slices of his tonsils all over the world. And it came back that really that both cancers had derived from his bone marrow. So they decided that a bone marrow transplant was the only way to go. Now, in March 2013, it's a long time ago now, but it's also not, you know, um, March 2013, he had his first bone marrow transplant. And this followed on from, you know, three and a half years of chemotherapy, radiotherapy, he had 22 rounds of total body radiation. Oh their, words were, their words were, we don't know what to do with him. So we're going to give him everything we can without killing him. So he had adult doses of every single chemotherapy drug going. They were just throwing everything at him. Um, he almost died from a number of infections before we even got to bone marrow transplant. It was just horrendous. 
bone marrow transplant happened um, from a donor in Germany, wonderful human being, and that one failed because he had a virus called adenovirus. And that virus that they were trying to treat was also killing off the new bone marrow. So it was kind of a, it just, it really went around in circles. So it failed his first one. So they gave him another one from the same donor. And sadly, he still had adenovirus. So that one failed also. So then they said to us, listen, um, thankfully before, after he'd had all of the, um, before, sorry, before he'd had all the radiation, they actually took some bone marrow from him, which they called a rescue dose. So that if they put it in a freezer, you know, so that if all this went wrong, they'd have something to give him, thank God. So they took that. Um, so when his second one failed, they said, look, his graft versus host disease was absolutely horrendous. It was, I mean, his mouth all the way to his anus was just blistered. Um, oh his God. skin was affected. His skin was literally, he was like a, le he was like a, a reptile where his skin was just like, it was horrible. And so they said to us, look, the, the graft versus host disease is so horrendous right now. We're not gonna bother with another transplant from, from the guy. Like we're gonna give him his own cells back. But the doctor said to me at that time, and this is where I first discovered nature, as the doctor said to me at this time, so um, we're gonna give him his own cells back, but we're not going to treat the adenovirus anymore. And it takes 23 days for a bone marrow transplant to kick in, and we're not gonna treat the adenovirus. So one is gonna win, I suggest you pray. And I was like- Oh uh, my God, I just <laughs> can't imagine what that must have felt like. It was- horrible um and so i turned to the google gods and in fact they had told me all the way up until this point do not go on the internet we will tell you everything you need to know and i did i, I listened to them at this point i was like no there has to be something else so i googled natural alternatives for adenovirus which is a very simple virus that many of us will pick up and carry around and not even know but when you have no immune system obviously it's uh you know it can be very detrimental and so I found olive leaf extract, lemon balm, echinacea, manuka honey, uh, olive leaf, uh, vitamin C, all these things. And I was like, okay. So off I went <laughs> down to the health food store and to this little apothecary across the road and came back with all of this stuff. And within a week, I had his adenovirus gone. Within oh a week. Oh my God. Um, oh wow. His, his virus count went from 3.2 million down to just under a thousand kind of within that week to 10 days. Now, the worst thing was about this, and I, I don't usually tell this story when I do an interview, but it seems fitting right now, is that um, one of the doctors, the one that actually told me to pray, um, he's called Dr. Doom in my book. He came in and he said, um, he said, I don't understand what's going on. And I said, what, what's happened? And he said, well, he said, Darren's count has gone back up to 3.2 million overnight. And I said, how, how can that be? I said, can that be a, a, a mistake in the lab? Are you reading the wrong results? I said, because that seems very, very, you know, that's a very definite number to go back down, you know, up from a thousand up to 3.2 million. And he said, no, there's no mistake. We don't make mistakes like that. There's absolutely no mistake. And <laughs> you so never I, make mistakes in the medical never profession. Make mistakes. No, absolutely not. And I said, well, what, what, what? I don't understand. And they said, well, we don't understand because by all intents and purposes, Darren doesn't look like he has a viral count of 3.2 million. And I said, no, I know he doesn't. So he said, well, you know, that's what it is. And we're really sorry. We don't, we don't know what else to do. And then he turned and he looked at all of the other stuff I had on the end of the table. And he said, oh, what's all this? And I said, well, this is olive leaf extract. It does such and such. It blocks proteins and blah, 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 blah. And this is blah, blah, blah. And he looked at me and he went, well, it's not working, is it? And he just walked out the room. Oh. oh, and I was, I was left like so. Ha, that means my son's gonna die, but you're okay with that because my, you know, and it's there was a lot of those kinds of things that went on. Well, anyway, thank thankfully a, another doctor came to my room that night at about half past ten at night, and I was absolutely beside myself because I was like, well, I've tried every, I don't know what else to do now. My son's gonna die because the bone marrow transplant was still way off you know and a doctor came to my door and he said oh I just wanted to let you know he said there was a mistake in the lab he said it's it's still under a thousand oh. and I said well thank you, very, thank you very much for putting me out of my misery and then the doctor doom came back the next morning trying to give me the good news and I said don't worry somebody's already put me out of my misery it's not working no it's not working and of course he walked out the room again so that's when I really discovered that nature had something going on and um so then sadly that third transplant did fail. <laughs> um, 
They said that nobody had ever failed from their own cells. Well, he did. Somehow, we don't know how this happened, but somehow the T cells were um, Darren's and all of the other cells were the donors. I, I, the donors were supposed to be gone, but then there was, he had two sets of DNA. They did chimerisms on him. It was like, it was crazy. They'd never seen anything like this before. So they then said, they then said, look, we're going to give him more chemotherapy to make sure there's absolutely nothing in his bone marrow, nothing there whatsoever. Devin wasn't best pleased about this. I'm not going to lie. Um, he actually told me to just let him go. He didn't want any more chemotherapy. He didn't want to keep going through that just to let him go. Which and I sorry, find how how old was he at this point to actually 13. say let me go? Thirteen. 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 Yeah. Um, and he it was actually quite interesting. Um, just after his second transplant failed, I remember I was sat on the toilet and he was sat in the bath and and I was just talking to him and I said, dude, how are you not angry at the world? I was like, because he was diagnosed with autism, Tourette syndrome, and ADHD when he was eight years old. And then cancer when he was 10 and then cancer again when he was 12 and he'd gone through all of this. And I said, you know, there are a lot of people who are dealt a lot less cards than this and, and, they're, and they're angry at the world. I said, how do you not get angry? And he looked at me and he said, well, mum, I chose this. And I said, okay, oh. embellish, embellish <laughs> for me as a 13 year old oh. boy, embellish. And he said, um, I'll never forget his words. He said, mum, throughout our many lives, our souls need to experience all there is to experience. And it's only when our souls are strong enough that they can take on their biggest challenge. This is my biggest challenge. I'm not coming back. And I, and it gives me goosebumps even now. And I looked I'm, at him and I'm, I, I'm welling up. <laughs> and, Holy uh, crap. He, he's an incredible human being, my boy. And, um, and I said to him, I went, well, I believe you. I absolutely believe you. And he said, well, I chose you, mum, because you needed to learn some lessons. And he said, we all chose each other. He said, so how can I be mad? This is this is what I came here for. And I said, OK. So um, months and months later on, when his, his third transplant has failed and they want to give him chemo and he's like, no, just let me go. And I said to him, do you know what, dude? I said, as much as you chose this, I said, you have to see this through to the natural bitter end. I said, because if you don't, what's going to happen? And he said, I'll have to come back and do this all over again. And I said, and do you want to do that? And he went, no. And I said, well, I also think you chose me because I won't let you give up. I'm not letting you give up. I said, if there was nothing else, then I would absolutely hold your hand and say, let's go. But there is still some, there is one more chance you have to take this. So he agreed, he had the chemotherapy and he had his fourth and final transplant. Thankfully, someone had split that bag into two. So he had his fourth and final transplant in the October of 2013. And three days later, he trapped his fingers down the side of the hospital bed. And he picked up two catastrophic infections in his hand and one in his, he already had one in his mouth called um, Klebsiella, which is like MRSA on steroids. And so that ate a portion of his tongue. He, his hand just went black. Like I have pictures on the internet. I haven't put them in my book because they're pretty gruesome, but um, I have pictures where his hand, I mean, his hand was just necrotic now. They wanted to amputate his hand. <laughs> and I said, hang on a second, let's just have a look at some other things here. Um, and he was already on morphine and fentanyl. He was on the highest dose of, he'd had ketamine, pethidine, you name it. I'd seen him pumped with all of it. And so I started looking again. I went, turned back to the Google gods, natural painkillers. What's a natural painkiller? Cannabis. Yep. Okay. Wonderful. And I was like, well, um, and I found this article, I found some things about a guy who'd been prescribed Bedrocan, which is a cannabis based medicine that's available in Amsterdam and in, and in Europe. And so I went to the oncologist and I said, listen, I found this other alternative that maybe we can try this before we cut his hand off. Um, I just need a prescription. I'll drive over and get it. And she said, no, it's not licensed for children. Oh. Neither is chemotherapy. Neither is chemotherapy, by the way. <laughs> I didn't know that, really. And yet, them. and yet yeah. they will take your child into care if, if you, you do not poison them. If you yeah. do not do it.